Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third uh, paper in our series of uh, macro modeling and modeling of pandemics. Uh, it's under the auspices of the uh, Macro Modeling and Model Comparison Network um, at CPR and uh, the joint initiative by Stanford uh, Hoover Institution and here the IMFS at Goethe University. Uh, it's great here to have today uh, Daniel Gross. He's actually joining us from uh, Berkeley, uh, where he's currently based, and Claudius Gross, who's uh, his brother in Frankfurt, who's a physicist. Daniel is an economist, um, so it's an interdisciplinary um, cross uh, Atlantic uh, paper. Uh, there are two more family members. Uh, physicist and a medical doctor, uh, Rosa Valenti, Kilian Valenti, uh, who are um, a part of this analysis or have uh, written this paper. So we're looking very much forward to it. Uh, I'll hand over uh, to John. Just one thing I want to mention before, uh, you can all post questions on the uh, Q&A tool of Zoom, uh, write up your questions and say we take 30, 40 minutes. Um, Daniel and Claudius will split the presentation um, and uh, when we're through the paper, we take the questions uh, and shouldn't use more than uh, one hour. So I hand over to John uh, from Stanford. Uh, any remarks? Also, you might want to add uh, before we get started. Well, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. So looking forward to this presentation. Thanks to Daniel and his colleagues very much. I didn't realize we were so close geographically, Stanford and Berkeley, kind of ri rivalries in very ways, but not today. Anyway, it's a very important subject how uh, econometric models, models in general, can be modified, adapted, uh, used better for this very important pandemic we're facing. So this is a great example of this and we appreciate your participation. So thank you very much. So Daniel, up to you. Thank you very much. Now let me try to share my screen. I hope it now works. And uh, so I have the pleasure of going first in this, as you said, transatlantic uh, uh, exercise and trying to bring together uh, an economist, medical doctor, and a physicist who knows about uh, complex systems uh, to add perhaps modestly uh, to our understanding on how we should look at the uh, Social economic and the medical costs of a, a pandemic. And uh, as I said, uh, our exercise, our paper tries to basically combine two aspects. Uh, we would like to uh, provide some very simple uh, back of the envelope, really, estimates of the cost of the epidemic or of an epidemic in general and take, of course, the parameters of the current COVID crisis. And then uh, we would like to combine that uh, with uh, a perhaps innovative model of how one can uh, uh, provide a structure for thinking about the evolution uh, of the uh, pandemic, where, just to say it immediately, one of the key assumptions is that uh, the social distancing we are uh, observing uh, is perhaps a function of the spread of the disease itself, uh, providing uh, some feedback. And uh, so I just will go uh, later into the details of that. And uh, when we combine these two, how much, what are the costs, and uh, how does the epidemic evolve? I think we can perhaps give you some background also for understanding other models and other papers. Uh, we do not want to say that our approach is the only one, but perhaps I can give you uh, some metrics uh, which are useful also when looking at uh, other models. And let me start immediately with something which I think by now, or a figure which I think by now most people have seen, um, and that is the representation of uh, the uh, uh, an epidemic, uh, <coughs> epidemic uh, outbreak, where you have on the horizontal uh, axis the uh, the new case, the sorry, the total cases, capital X, on the horizontal, on the vertical axis, sorry, uh, the infected. 
And here I just wanted to make uh, two, uh, two simple points, but points perhaps which add a little bit uh, to the discussion. Uh, here we have uh, in the, what is that, not blue, but um, violet, I don't know how to qualify that color in English, a line uh, which you have a herd on top. This is an outbreak uh, which is uh, left uh, unchecked uh, with a reproduction factor G0 equals to three. And uh, we want just to make, want to make two points. Uh, one is you have this maximum point there which is often called herd immunity, but it's really only the point at which the, the number of new infection peaks. It continues uh, thereafter. And uh, if you have this uh, reproduction factor, uh, we know that uh, of three, we, have, we know that the uh, peak is around uh, two thirds, 56%. But what's often understood is that then the, the total number of infected will in the end be much higher. It will in this case be over 90%. So that's, that's the first point. And also the model implies that uh, the down Hill part of the trajectory should be somewhat steeper uh, than the uphill part. Basically because as the uh, number of uh, persons which say still get infected or can get infected diminishes, uh, the speed with which the uh, um, infections uh, go through the population uh, diminishes uh, rapidly. And then you see the, the green line uh, which is uh, the way we think uh, an epidemic might evolve if uh, there is what we call a history of way of control, namely if social distancing measures, meaning either measures by the government or uh, <clears throat> patterns adopted spontaneously by the population uh, spread the disease. And that leads to the famous flattening of the curve that everybody has talked about but also then to a lower total level of uh, infected. And you see already immediately that this curve has a somewhat different uh, shape. It is not as steep on the, on the downhill side. So these are the two elements which we keep in place. And I will come back in my, my initial part uh, several times to the fact that the, the intercept uh, on the horizontal axis is very different. Uh, the total number of infected uh, in fact, that uh, is unchecked close to 100% and checked, it can be much, much lower. And uh, I wanted to keep you, I wanted you to keep these uh, two points uh, in mind. Now, let me now come to the uh, uh, economic costs of an epidemic. Uh, of course, we all know that they have to be weighted against uh, the, the cost of the lockdown. And I think you had already a model uh, last week on that. Uh, we also have, I think, all in the back of our minds uh, what the IMF has projected, the European Commission has projected, namely a loss of uh, output of around 9 to 10% of GDP. And then the question is, uh, is that outweighed uh, by uh, the potential costs of a, of a disease which would have run unchecked uh, through the population. And here we make, uh, we make one argument, which I think is not uh, uh, given enough attention in the uh, discussion, which is that the pure medical costs, hospitalization, et cetera, are important in and themselves. Uh, most other papers uh, just look at the value of lives lost as the counterpart to the uh, economic uh, cost of the lockdown. And we think here is an important part uh, uh, that we should look at. And that's why also we have a medical doctor in, in our team. And uh, we do so in, uh, uh, in a very simple way and hopefully a way which is not too specific for the countries that uh, where we take the examples to give you a metric which could be used uh, for, for other countries, let's say OECD countries uh, with similar uh, me <coughs> uh, medical and health uh, systems. And uh, two uh, simplifying elements which I wanted to like mention immediately are, we take out discounting, which you find in 
most models, but we found that uh, if you uh, look about uh, this epidemic, which takes months, not years, it's not really materially relevant. Uh, you all know yourself, if you take a social discount factor of 5%, uh, in a year, it doesn't make a big difference. If you were to take market interest rates of zero, of course, wouldn't make any difference at all. And then we, we, we provide most figures uh, as a percent of GDP per capita, which again, as I mentioned earlier, provides for easier comparison across uh, countries. Um, so let me just go a little bit into the details. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the non-life costs are the costs which come not uh, from people dying or the economic value of the lives lost but uh, just for people having to go to hospitals and taking up resources and here uh, one can look at it two ways one can do a top down by just looking at actual costs known so far at the aggregate level and bottom up at looking at uh, individual elements uh, that we know uh, come uh, through infections. And let me walk you very quickly through the details. Um, if there's interest, uh, in it, the details are also in the, in the paper. So let me just make one example. In Germany, uh, the Ministry of Health has so far budgeted around 10 billion. Um, and if you divide that by the number of uh, people uh, which have been infected in Germany, uh, then you get uh, cost per case of around 50,000 or about, let's say 100% of uh, German GDP per capita per case, right? And uh, for Spain, you find something similar. But let's take the German figure. If it really were 100% of GDP per capita per case, and then if you were to multiply that by the potential cases still to be uh, uh, waiting to happen, then of course uh, you can get to very very large number uh, and i think this is uh, this is uh, the, the top down uh, approach now if you bottom up uh, we we also try to uh, just uh, look at uh, what is known about uh, the uh, the typical a uh, typical average cause of the of the disease or those uh, infected and this is the, the second uh, way to look at the, uh, the non-life costs. And here I've given you uh, the, the main points, which is, of course, we all know one half are asymptomatic. Um, we estimate that uh, those uh, who are symptomatic will lose uh, uh, two, two periods of two weeks uh, of symptoms plus isolation. Uh, let me make a parenthesis here. The two-week uh, uh, period is the one that we take as representative for the cause uh, of uh, this uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, infection. And then we assume that uh, about 20% of all cases have a, uh, are needed some hospitalization. And when you look actually at the cost of hospitalizations, you find it's rather large for each individual case that might be up to 30% uh, of uh, annual GDP. As I said, the details in euros you can find in the paper. And then there are those that say 5% of all cases, uh, uh, which uh, then provide <coughs> or lead to an additional cost of around, again, in, not in euros, but in terms of percent of GDP around 60% of, of annual GDP. So the, the, the rough estimate is that uh, already uh, per case, you should think about uh, pure medical costs of around 9% of GDP per capita and uh, a loss of working time of about 5%. So you have around 14% of GDP per capita loss uh, per case again. And then I leave it to you to estimate how many cases there could be. Um, and as I said, the, the, the maximum would be if the disease were to run through the 93% uh, of the population uh, that it would have according to the simple CN model, uh, then you would have to, you would come to the conclusion that 
the medical costs alone could be in the order of uh, 14 uh, percent of GDP. So this is just to, to show uh, how some simple calculations can give you an idea of uh, these uh, costs. And then there is the uh, uh, economic cost of lives loss. I presume in last year's, and sorry, last week's paper and in many other, the approach taken is usually you take the value of a statistical life and then you multiply it by projected uh, fatality. And here we think there's a problem because uh, that number is usually taken from environmental or food safety studies where you have usually very slow, very low probability of uh, death. And uh, the value which is usually taken is around is millions of uh, euros or dollars and it's up to 100 times uh, uh, annual GDP. And then if you see these models, you should tell yourself immediately, that implies that uh, if you have a fatality rate of only 0.1%, uh, which is like an influenza, the cost of life loss would already be 10% of GDP, right? Or if you had a, uh, a fatality rate of 1%, which is what many people say might be not too far from, uh, from the reality now, then uh, you would immediately come to really very high uh, values like 100% of GDP. So uh, these models using this uh, value of uh, uh, statistical life loss uh, imply uh, uh, very high uh, losses from, uh, from uh, letting the disease run through the population. We are taking a more conservative approach uh, because we argue that one should really use more the approach used in medical practice where every day you have to make this uh, trade-off. Should I use uh, buy, or should I buy as a hospital more life-saving equipment? At what point is that too expensive? And uh, here the key value is usually uh, a year of life loss. And uh, how to value that year? Again, we refer to the literature which is around one to three times of GDP per capita. And if you do that, of course, uh, the age specific fatality rates have become decisive. And that is uh, what I wanted to present you, which is not yet, I think, in the version of the paper which you have seen. What I have done here is um, I have uh, taken uh, different uh, uh, age brackets I hope you can see them because uh, they're covered, in my view, by uh, by your pictures. <laughs> oh, we can um, we can we can see them very well. Daniel. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, if you that's from the from the right hand side of the table, and then uh, one has to multiply them by the case fatality rate for that age bracket, which we all know are very very different, ranging from uh, zero point seven. Uh, to 16% for the very uh, old ones. Um, and then you have to multiply that with the share in the population, uh, which you see in, in the fourth uh, uh, column. And that uh, gives you an idea of the contribution to the total fatalities, uh, which these different age brackets give you. That's in column three. Um, and then Sorry uh, to go one more uh, column, which is the remaining years of life expectancy in this age bracket, number two. Okay, and then finally, <laughs> column one gives you the end result you're interested in, how much each age bracket uh, uh, contributes to the years of life loss, again, per statistical infection. And you can see that uh, it's not only the very old ones which contribute to the total, for the simple reason that these relative low fatality rates uh, for the younger people count more because they have a longer uh, statistical life expectancy. Um, and uh, so if you sum uh, the, uh, the entries on the first column, uh, then uh, the result would be that uh, 
per case, uh, you would have a 0 0.7, 27, sorry, uh, percent uh, reduction uh, in uh, lives uh, lost uh, per standard mortality table. Uh, we all know that uh, COVID fatalities typically are associated with comorbidity, uh, but here I refer to a recent study which actually shows that uh, um, uh, these comorbidity factors would not have been changed much uh, the remaining life expectancy of those uh, who uh, actually uh, did uh, die through the uh, uh, through COVID uh, infection. So <clears throat> we come to the result that the lower bound for the value of life loss would be basically the 0 0.27 percent multiplied by the lower bound uh, by of one GDP per one annual GDP per capita per years of life loss. And that would be then adding another 20, 0.25% of GDP per capita per infection per percent as percent of the population. And again, up to your guess uh, how much that will add up to uh, when you think the disease runs to the entire population or only a small percentage uh, because of measures taken uh, uh, too slow uh, and it speeds. So uh, perhaps I've spoken already too much. Um, we have two key results, I think. Top down and bottom up estimates, both basically both concur that the uh, cost, the pure medical cost of a disease running unchecked to the population would be very high in the order of 10% of GDP. That's similar to the loss of GDP expected by the IMF uh, and the commission. And that if you take into account the value of the uh, economic value of the loss of life loss, then you would have uh, even higher uh, uh, costs uh, for society. So on that, it seems to me that perhaps I shouldn't have written that the great lockdown was justified, but uh, maybe uh, its economic costs were smaller than the alternative. And, uh, how one could get then uh, to uh, a, uh, um, a lower spread of the disease and how one can model that, I leave uh, to my co-author and brother Claudius. Okay, so shall I go on? Okay, then I go on. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me. So I'm not an economist, as uh, Professor Wieland was saying. I'm from theoretical physics, and my field is in the past more complex systems, uh, neurosciences, and uh, many other things. Just to mention, uh, we had another co-author, Daniel, uh, I forgot to uh, mention, uh, Lukas Schneider, who did all the uh, analysis of the uh, real-world data. So let me come into media res. <clears throat> so this is just a reminder of the classical SEER model, which probably most of you know pretty well by the time now. So we have three variables, susceptible, so the people who can be infected, I, the people uh, infected, which is not really correct, it's the people who are infectious, also it can transmit the disease, and they recovered. And uh, we write it in this way. This is the equation uh, for the change of the susceptible. And we have a time scale tau in front of uh, all the equation such that the right hand side is dimensionless because ds uh, by dt times tau is then dimensionless. So the right hand side is dimensionless. We have the growth rate g, which is then also a dimensionless quantity in this representation. And uh, yes, uh, the number of uh, susceptible changes from somebody who can be infected meets somebody who is infectious, uh, and that is the process. And uh, vice versa, the number of infected increases and the number of recovering people, <coughs> people who are recovered increases. Now in uh, many newspapers, you see this representation, uh, the timeline was a function of 
time, you'll have time over tau. Uh, this is the peak uh, uh, Danny was talking about. This is also for g equals three. Uh, you have a peak and then, it, then uh, uh, most of the population is infected and the total number of infected increases. It's an S-shaped curve. Some people call it a uh, log uh, uh, logistic curve, but it is in general just an S-shaped curve. What we will use, as uh, Dani was pointing out, is mostly this representation <coughs> in phase space. So we don't, the time is implicit here, not explicit. So we will always plot the total number of cases that are currently infected. And just to show how this looks like uh, for some countries, uh, this is uh, not systematic, it's just three countries, Germany, United States, and Italy. Uh, in this case, it's as, uh, as a percentage of the total population, so the numbers are small because it's a fraction of the total population, uh, total cases and new daily cases as a fraction of the population, which is of course small, just to compare all these three uh, countries. And uh, the timeline is plotted, for example, A4 means April 4th, this is April uh, 14, and this is my May 4th, so here you see the development for Germany uh, as it should be, uh, like a normal outbreak. You go up, you have a peak, and then you go down more or less with the same uh, shape. I will come to back um, to this point uh, later on. Uh, a a well-behaved behaved outbreak has this kind of uh, inverse parabola. <clears throat> you see for Italy, uh, so first of all, you see that all three countries have the same slope. That is not surprising because that is a universe that depends only on the growth rate. But uh, the countries uh, change in, uh, what they do mostly after the peak. And Italy is going down slower, much slower than Germany. Uh, and the United States at the moment has a hard time to go down. It's uh, very weakly going down. Now you can of course argue, and that is of course a valid uh, uh, argument, that this data is very unreliable because it depends on testing and the number of tests you perform is much lower here at the, at the start than in the end. So the, because of that, you can do exactly the same representation, not with the case counts, but with the people who died, the death count. So you do exactly the same on the x-axis you plot the total number of people who have died up to a certain date. And on the y-axis, you plot the new daily cases. By the way, we have always a seven-day average. So we don't take the raw data, but the data just average over one week. And you will notice that the curve looks pretty similar. So Germany is more or less like a, a shape. Of course, you don't go so much down as, it, as you did it uh, with the case counts because the dead counts, of course, lack, so you're not so far down as with the case count. United States is pretty flat after the peak, and Italy is going down. Now, uh, the curves look similar, but are they really similar? And you can test that. Now, here we have plotted, uh, for in this case for Italy and Spain, both uh, ways to represent the epidemic at the same plot. So the uh, solid uh, uh, dots are the case counts, just as before, it's exactly the same data, averaged over one week. And the open uh, symbols are the death counts, but of course you have less people who are die, so you multiply that, you rescale them. And you rescale the death count to X axis and the Y axis. And you see you nearly have a, a complete uh, data collapse uh, which means that the death counts cause uh, very closely the infected uh, count. And in our view, this is a pretty strong indication that uh, statistical factors like undercounting of the number of um, <coughs> infected do not change dramatically. Of course, there will be undercounting, a substantial undercounting, but how much undercounting there is, it's probably not changing in a relevant way. Otherwise, it's, uh, uh, we wouldn't have this very nice data collapse. Now, this is just an empirical observation. It doesn't have to hold for all countries. It's not so good for Spain. There's a factor of nine, and it's even worse for Germany. So this is Germany. Here's the case counts. Uh, 
and here the death counts. Here the factor is 22 because in Germany we have less deaths, people, people, less people dying. And you see here there's a big part of people missing to die, which should have died if the data collapse would have been perfect, but there's a gap here. It's just an empiric observation, of course. It's not a law of nature. It doesn't have to hold, but it seems to hold in quite a few cases. Now, as Daniel said, uh, uh, our key work was to introduce a new model, namely that the reduction is not constant, but there's a self consistency condition in the certain sense that the, that the reproduction factor depends uh, actually on the status of the um, epidemic. The so X here is the total case count and I the uh, number of people currently infected. And so the rationale is that either people spontaneously react to what they read in the newspapers, oh, so many new cases, and then they try to avoid each other, they do social distancing, and that reduces the reproduction factor. Or they look at the newspaper and say, already 10,000 dead people or whatever, and they react to these numbers, either in this way or in the other way. We call the one a history away or long-term control because you take into account the complete history of the epidemics from the start. And this we call short-term control because only the current status uh, of the uh, uh, epidemic outbreaks is uh, taken into account. And that is a picture Dani already showed that uh, if you don't uh, do anything, you have an uncontrolled outbreak. But if you calculate the model here uh, and you have, for this case, uh, long-term control, the history way of control, you reduce the peak dramatically and uh, the uh, total number of infected. A very nice thing, which is actually key to our fitting, is you can solve this model analytically. So I will show that uh, for you for the case of uh, long-term control. So these are the two uh, e first equations of the SEER model. We don't need the uh, third equation. And what we do now is just to divide these two equations. So we divide uh, the second equation by the first equation. Now if you divide these two equations, it drops out, uh, I drops out because you divide them. And uh, S is ds by dt, this is di by dt, the dt also drops out. So dividing these two equations, you get this one here. di by ds is one minus gs divided by gs. Now you multiply that by ds, you get it on the right hand side. You plug in the expression of g, the expression of g is g0 divided by one plus, one plus alpha times x, and x is one minus s, you get this expression. Uh, and uh, this you can integrate immediately, that's no problem. One over s gives you a logarithm, the other one linear terms, and you get an explicit uh, analytic expression um, for the uh, number of currently infected as a function of the number of total infection up to date. That's an exact expression uh, for this model. And uh, of course, when you do the integration, you get an integration constant, and the integration constant is determined by the condition that when the disease starts, uh, x equals zero, i is of course zero. That determines the integration constant. And equivalently, you can uh, derive a similar expression for short-term control. Now the issue is, can you fit real-world data with this kind of expression? Does the theory make sense? <coughs> so, as I said before, we have just a few uh, random, more or less randomly selected countries for illustration. So this here is Australia, which is nearly perfect in the sense they really did their job very well. They are nearly exactly on a parabola, just very low here. They relax a little bit. And the parabola is the result if you only have long-term uh, long control. Then you have an exact parabola. And you can estimate uh, how much percentage of long-term to short-term control you have. And for Australia, you have a very good value, nearly 
well, 97%, while we cannot actually estimate that so accurately. It's nearly perfectly long-term control and everything is uh, nicely uh, done. Another one country is Austria. It's a blue one here, uh, Österreich. And as you see in real world data, even so it's already averaged over seven days, it's pretty uh, difficult to fit. Fit is not too bad, but of course, it's just a phenomenological theory and you cannot expect to be perfectly good. And there you, they also do it well in this analysis, 80% long-term control. You also see an example where you say, wow, this might be a bad fit. This is Sweden here because we don't really fit here the, the first part, which is actually important. We fit the overall shape and that shows you in the end, every country can do whatever they want. They don't have to follow the theory or the theoretical uh, uh, modeling. And here you could argue why well, that is not really a controlled uh, fit. So it, it works for quite a few uh, astonishing large number of countries, but not for all. Um, I have three more countries here. One is Germany, because some of you are living in Germany, me too. That is the green curve here. Uh, it follows pretty nicely the theory, actually. Uh, I think that is uh, pretty nice. And um, uh, we have about 50% long-term control. This is not bad, but you could do better. And of course, you can extrapolate very nicely because in this XI representation, everything becomes uh, linear in the end. And you just have to do essentially linear expo extrapolation, but this is a full theory, of course. And you can uh, estimate how many infected people you will have in the end of the day if nothing changes, of course, if the policy doesn't change. And here, this would be 180,000 uh, people in Germany. For Italy, as you see, uh, it's going down much slower. And uh, indeed, uh, you have only 30% long-term uh, control, which is, uh, uh, and that is the reason why Italy has a hard time to get their inf uh, infection rates uh, down, and you would have a larger number here. And the United uh, Kingdom, well, it's also difficult here. You could say, well, I don't really trust this fit. And as I said, in some cases, that works out nicely, not all. Uh, of course, uh, since we're living in Europe and some of you are living in the US, you want, may want to compare the United States with Europe as a whole. So the blue curve is uh, the EU 28. So all 28 of the, no, so sorry, the green curve is the, uh, is the uh, EU 28 here. And the blue curve is US. So together we, we did see this data before and it's pretty flat here. And um, so there's, in this kind of analysis, the United States has only 10% uh, long-term control and the US has, and, and the EU, European Union as a whole, about 40%. Now, uh, the issues which you, you, you might think, and that is really a, a very valid issue is, well, in the United States, like in Europe, we have many different uh, states, and maybe every state is, is a nice parabola, but they come one after each, uh, each other. And that is actually in partly true. Now, this is a little bit difficult to see. To see. Um, here we have the timeline now. So here's a date, April 1st. This is May 1st. Um, the timeline of the infection from the largest state in the United States. And this blue curve is famously in New York. So actually New York uh, uh, and what we plotted here is a relative number, not the absolute number. So relative number means uh, what we did is the peak we normalized to one, just in order to compare uh, these curves. It's not the absolute number, but all peak numbers has been normalized to one. And so we have here New York, which is uh, nicely peak and going down. That's the blue curve. Afterwards comes Florida. But there are some states which peak nearly one month later. For example, Illinois, you see the red curve, Illinois, 
it's just reaching now the peak, or maybe it's still be still going a little bit up. And Texas is similar, it has a half a peak going down and going up again. So for the United States, it's true that uh, one of the reasons uh, the total numbers don't really go down so fast is that you want uh, many states which peak at different times, a substantially different time, one month. Now in this sense, you could say that the theory developed is not really applicable because we want to describe one uh, out peak as, um, as a unit. However, if you would look uh, to an out peak, let's say in a certain city like whatever, Bergamo or, uh, or Milano, and even an outbreak in a, in a given city is made up of many different outbreaks coming one after another. So maybe you have an, uh, a meat factory, which has a big outbreak. You have an, uh, a residency for old people, which has an outbreak. You have a religious uh, uh, a community, which has an outbreak. So even in one, if you look at a smaller, in a smaller scale, you will have something similar that the different communities will have connected, interrelated outbreaks, but not at the same time. So in this sense, uh, it is not quite clear whether this here is to be attributed to independent outbreaks or to, as our theory describes, a series of many uh, interrelated outbreaks. So that is uh, actually a very interesting question, I think, which is from the theory side not completely uh, settled. So lastly, I want to come to make a much closer connection to what uh, Daniel has said, namely to the costs, how we actually did uh, estimate the total cost. Now, one of the uh, main efforts of the paper was, if you have all these cost esti estimates, and if you have a model which allows us to model a whole outbreak, we can actually uh, evaluate the total cost as a function of strategy because we can uh, fit the whole outbreak from the beginning to the end. We don't have to readapt the parameters. So um, as Danny said, all the costs are in percentage of uh, uh, GPD. And the uh, key assumption which we do in the paper is that the economic costs are proportional to the reduction of the reproduction factor. So G is the reduction factor. If I divide by G0, its value without control, I get the reduction. But of course, the costs are not proportional to this, but to the reduction relatively to one. Uh, as Daniel said, we have normally two weeks period we took. So that's two divided by 52. And we have a proportionality factor, which uh, as Daniel uh, explained, one can estimate around uh, one quarter and so. But if we do this assumption, uh, and uh, there are good reason, uh, uh, well, we believe at least, uh, there are good reasons to do this assumption. Uh, then you can estimate not only the currently, but the total hours cost over the whole course. So that is shown here, for example, that is a direct medical cost without the value of life. So we have here the social distancing cost, the direct medical cost, and the sum of the two costs. And we have evaluated for two strategies, long-term control and short-term control. And uh, we have evaluated as a function of the control strength, which is our alpha, depending alpha x or alpha i, if it's long-term or short-term. And so uh, no control means is this point here, because alpha equals zero means no control. So that these are the total costs if you don't do anything. And the total cost, uh, if you have short-term control, always goes up. Uh, and the total cost uh, goes down uh, slightly uh, when uh, you don't take into account value of life cost. But if you include value of life cost, uh, they make a much bigger impact. And then uh, saving, you save much more money uh, by having long-term control, which means strict uh, lockdown. Uh, of course, as Daniel said, you already there's a factor here, but of course, adding costs, uh, the value of life cost means you will save more 
uh, if you do a strict contract. So that is essentially uh, all I wanted to tell you. <laughs> Just let me recap. Um, so the key point is that the entire outbreak is fit with four parameters. So there's no real adjustment of the parameter because we do uh, new measurements. Uh, there's the intrinsic reproduction factor. There's either long or short-term control and there's a typical time scale. Uh, and with these four uh, parameters, we can actually not fit uh, uh, COVID-19 outbreaks, but also other non outbreaks like the MERS outbreak in Korea in 2015. And it's a very nice uh, parabola. Uh, and because we can fit the entire outbreak, we can estimate the overall costs uh, specific to the policy selected. And uh, one can extract empirically, if one believes the theory, uh, country-specific policies, so the policies the country has have followed. Of course, that is just a phenomenological theory. There's no law of nature that any country has to follow this modeling. So this is uh, a theory which we believe to work if there are a large number of components which contribute, because any individual, of course, could say, in the country, we change completely policy, we do something completely else, and then of course, all our modeling will be uh, void. So we believe if it's a large number of individual event, events sums up, uh, this might be a pretty good description of what really is going on. Of course, the big problem, as I already said, in the data is undercounting, how much testing do you do? <laughs> and uh, that's for example, why we uh, like also to looking at the death counts. There's of course undercounting also for the people who die, but maximally a factor of two. Uh, there have been many, many studies that you miss COVID-19 uh, uh, deaths, but uh, not to that extent like you miss infected. Well, thank you very much. And that is what I wanted to tell you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Daniel and Claudius, for your clear presentation. Um, any did you want to add anything, uh, Daniel? Perhaps I was uh, too too much emphasis on the uh, on the medical and other costs. As Claudius mentioned, we also provide this model of the what lockdown costs, mm -hmm. and uh, they are basically. Uh, the parameter there is taken from the uh, Chinese uh, experience uh, where we basically say if you want to get to the six to eight percent drop in GDP after uh, a couple of months of lockdown, uh, then we get to this parameter 0 0.25 of loss of GDP basically for the period of the lockdown. Thank you. Um, as I just want to mention to uh, everyone listening, uh, you can post your questions now. You can also vote on, there are a few questions have already been posed, but I want to give a bit of room to post more questions and to vote on the questions. In the meantime, I want to uh, just throw in, uh, one, I want to use that <laughs> to throw in one question myself. I mean, we had two uh, presentations um, this last week, uh, which were also focused on models of essentially one country and uh, um, then uh, looking at different incentives why people may choose voluntarily to do social distancing or how different containment policies could influence um, developments. Uh, what I liked also, you made this comparison empirically, checking how your model fits for different countries and for different regions. Um, and how this could explain, um, I like the result also for the US where you said, well, the, the, we have to take into account these different dynamics in different states. This, this brings me to the question, um, you know, we have this epidemic going around the globe at different speeds and uh, we don't have a, a, a vaccine. So as soon as we open up, uh, we might get a re-injection from another country. Right? So, or from another region or whoever uh, it is going on. So there could be a sequence of these outbreaks or, or maybe, I mean, I'm just asking. So um, what do you think about these spillover effects between different countries um, uh, or regions uh, in terms of your estimates and, and could there be a sequence of these things? Uh, because you kind of 
assume that it automatically ends uh, at a certain time. Shall I answer? So uh, the theory we developed is just for a single outbreak. And um, uh, uh, I mean, you can never predict, you can only predict maybe statistically these spillover effects, but not deterministically, of course. And, uh, um, and then you have to restart and see whether the spillover effect uh, 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 initiates, sorry, initiates <laughs> another well-defined outbreak or not. But uh, so there's also a different state. I didn't show the data for South Korea. Um, I think I forgot to put it here. But for South Korea, you have a very nice parabola. It follows perfectly the nice parabola. And then in the end of the parabola, you go in a different state where they have now very few cases, but at a continuous rate over two or three months. And of course, the parabola ends, and then you go a new state where you can track individually every uh, every infected. And so that is a different state, which is of course not described by an uh, uh, overall theory like our ones. Thank you. Let's go to the uh, question on top right now of the list by Gabriel Fagan. He said, um, could you elaborate on the concept of GDP per capita per case? In 2019, Germany GDP was 3.4 trillion euro. The extra 10 billion health expenditure you mentioned as amounts to 0.3% of GDP. This is well below the type of numbers you're citing, Daniel. Um, exactly. That is, that is completely right. But I was just saying that the 10 billion are uh, necessary for, let's say, about 200,000 cases. And if you divide the 10 billion by 200,000 cases so far, uh, then you get around 50,000 uh, euros per, per case. Uh, that was the number which I cited. So we always come back to this point, which is that uh, uh, we have so far seen an outbreak which has affected only very small proportion of the entire population. Uh, because of course, because of containment measures. And uh, the alternative was always the question, what if nothing had been done? And then we have, would have reached uh, 70, 80, 90% of the population. And then these numbers would have been by an order of two uh, magnitudes larger. That's why I find these numbers of spending so far still very impressive, given the very low percentage of the population which has been infected so far. Okay, um, the next question I have here, um, also from Gabriel, do you estimate alpha X and alpha Phi for each country? What can we say about different country policies on the basis of these estimates? I leave that to Charles, but let me just say that uh, our main concern had been to see whether uh, how the, the, the different political systems in countries react more to the, to the longer term or to the shorter term evolution of, uh, of the uh, spread of the infections. And uh, that we estimate uh, separately for each country. Claudia? Yeah, I, I think maybe this question was asked the before I showed all the slides, I'm not quite sure because uh, yes, we try to estimate that uh, by fitting uh, the data uh, to the exact analytic uh, solution. And um, now I'm not sure what I, yeah, this is, yeah. Okay. Uh, there is a there is a question on you have used VSL is it, is it, I mean the value of statistical life to estimate costs or I've talked about it um, in comparison right what about quality adjusted life years um, Q A L Y and the fiscal value of years of life lost F V Y L L I guess it should be much lower for quality estimates quality adjusted life and years. I first might say we have not used the value yeah. of statistical life because I thought this would be not appropriate uh, for the uh, for the COVID-19. 
Um, it is true that we have just taken uh, not quality adjusted years of life, but just years of life remaining. Um, I know that the quality aspect becomes important when you uh, are treating hospitals, people who have a very uh, uh, strong existing conditions which much diminishes the quality of their lives. Um, we think that despite the famous comorbidity factors, uh, the people who uh, did die through this uh, infection had otherwise, let's say, were able to lead a normal life and therefore we didn't do a quality adjustment. Then, um, question here by Andrew Velardo. How can you add the possibility of hysteresis related, say, to the pace of job separations and bankruptcies on trend GDP over the next, say, 10 years? This would seem to change the cost of GDP sharply. Um, yes, there we can only speculate. Mm. I cannot really uh, say anything uh, more on that. Okay. Uh, John, do you want to add uh, a question or two? Uh, you have to turn on the sound on your mic. I found the fits quite impressive. Uh, and the uh, question is how, how robust are those, uh, the estimates uh, for you know, modest changes and things like that? Uh, we do also now uh, Bayesian, uh, so these fits which I showed you were least square fits, but we also do Bayesian estimates now, which allows you to uh, estimate all this robustness and parameter. And uh, for most countries, they're pretty robust, uh, like Austria, Germany, and so, but for some countries, uh, like Sweden, they're not robust. It depends on the country. Uh, uh, yeah. So it depends, yeah. Not every country follows this effective model uh, to this extent. Uh, you said, I mean, maybe adding to, or John, did you wanna? Uh, uh, maybe adding to that question, you said you had also looked at, uh, at other outbreaks where we have maybe more data or more history of other uh, people estimating yeah. fits of such uh, dynamic uh, models. Yeah, do one, do you want um, could you see that you improve the fit in some case in, in earlier? If you want, I can show one or two more data. I could share my screen or do you want that? Or whichever, that? whichever. Or if you can just give us an indication, you know, uh, I'll just, how it... uh, I'll just do a quick share here. Uh, this here is uh, South Korea, the mm -hmm. mass outbreak in 2015. And um, it's a little bit small here, but uh, it's uh, pretty nice. Also, parabola in this sense. It's really prototypical, well defined one outbreak. It starts, has a peak, and it's controlled uh, by very strong uh, 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 long term uh, control. And uh, regarding to the fit, here we had a data collapse in the sense for many countries, uh, by the way, this is here, I forgot to say, this is here, uh, the red curve is South Korea of the COVID outbreak. Uh, you see it's a nice parabola, and then you go to the new state where you have individual uh, case tracing. Then you, you, of course, the parabola is not anymore valid because the outbreak essentially uh, goes into a, different, uh, into a different state. But otherwise, you can uh, do the data collapse in sense you uh, divide always by the peak. You put the peak to the one, and you divide by the peak of the x. So you put, put this one also to one. So the, the peak is at one, one, and many countries uh, follow this uh, 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 parabola like uh, shape. Thank you. Um, fascinating. And um, so I think we've basically addressed most of the questions here. Uh, the paper is available online, somebody asks, and we will be happy to, I mean, if you can send us the slides, we post them can I ask on the website. Question? Yes, go ahead. Can I, yes. can I ask a question to a question? Uh, Jamil Sadul means asked, whether the model is just only counterfactual. What does he mean with that? Yeah. 
I think uh, it means, Claudius, I think he means whether we are just uh, saying if you hadn't done control, then you would have had many more fatalities. Mm. But I think you implicitly answered when you showed your X, Y, I presentations mm. that uh, for the countries for which we fit, you actually provided mm. uh, our estimates of what the total uh, case count would be, for example, uh, mm. for Europe versus United States, mm. right? Uh, you, you didn't say so, I think, for the United States. Our prediction for the total case count, unless policy is drastically changed, would be 4.8 million, right? Whereas I think it was 1.5 million approximately for the European Union, according exactly, to the yeah. slide that you showed. That is one, one aspect of uh, the model that you can use to predict. Okay. Okay, there was also a, a question about to what extent will the model be relevant to model data post the lockdown era? Yeah, yeah. so um, now the model, of course, is based on continuous uh, policies, but so if the lockdown uh, lifting or the lockdown is extremely sharp, then the model wouldn't fit. Uh, and, uh, but it seems empirically that uh, the change in the policy is continuous, more or less, not for all countries, of course. Even so, uh, I mean, you do a lockdown a little bit and more and more and more. And so uh, to our, as far as we can just empirically compare with the data, uh, it seems to be remaining valid over a surprisingly large range also post lockdown. Can I add a bit to just uh, semantically? Um, it's like, one thing is the policy setting, and we might compare that in the case of monetary policy, how, uh, how aversion, how strong is the aversion of the central bank uh, uh, to inflation? What parameters do you fit in a Taylor rule, for example? And the question, and then of course, uh, you will find different interest rates depending on the state of the economy. And the different question is, do we get an entire new way of operating um, of the central bank and then the entire uh, rule changes. And our uh, model is uh, to say, our approach is to say, we have a certain way in which policy is being made in countries under the pressure of public opinion, how people react and so on and so forth. And if that framework is more or less constant, then you will have a lockdown which evolves, co-evolves with the mm -hmm. disease right, in response to the short-term and the long-term uh, aspects of the disease. And as long as that overall framework doesn't change, of course, if you have a total change in policy approach, then the model no longer works. Okay, um, excellent. So I think we're pretty much uh, at the end. We're a little over time. Um, I think we've addressed the, the key questions and uh, I think it's been also, um, Great to see you both in operation. Uh, that, that worked very well. It's the first one we did with two presenters, so excellent. And uh, John, uh, do you have any final remarks, um, comments, issues? Just thank you. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, I look forward to reading the paper more carefully. And I think the point that Daniel made at the end is what kind of size changes and how stable the model will be is very, very important in terms of uh, application. So thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, let me just let me just say so. On Wednesday, we have the talk uh, by Werner Röger from the European Commission about the models uh, they have used both uh, to study earlier uh, poss possible outbreaks like the the bird flu uh, in 2007-2008, but also recent modeling work they did uh, advising the European Commission on this um, epidemic and the e economic effects. And uh, next Monday, uh, it's particularly interesting uh, for people who are not in the German time zone. This will be worrying uh, you know, McKibben uh, from Australia, who's actually uh, mo done modeling on several, uh, economic modeling on several um, epidemics, and in particular on the COVID dynamic with a large scale model. So we're looking forward to that. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Claudius Gross. Uh, it's excellent to have you. Uh, John, great for tuning in, and we have this uh, Frankfurt uh, Bay Area connection today uh, in two ways.
So uh, goodbye and uh, good evening in, in Europe and uh, a very good rest of the day in California. So thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank bye you very much.